Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. Uh, those of you that uh, have family members that don't believe uh Well, you know, what's going on in the world? May I suggest a small little booklet called War is a Racket. It was written by Major General Smedley, S-M-E-D-L-E-Y, Butler. He was a two-star general, United States Marine Corps, he was one of the most decorated soldiers. Uh, well, he's one of, I think, well, one of the most decorated soldiers of, uh, of all time. However, he was, for a while, he was the most decorated Marine Corps uh, soldier ever. I think they had another one, Chesty Puller, I think they called him. He beat him out. But he's one of the most decorated soldiers of all time. Not that decorations matter. But uh, it's strange that uh, he died just before World War II. Well, well let's just say... Before he died, just before the United States got into World War II, yeah. So, and to be a general, um, the military cannot promote a general or an admiral. Congress has to do that. They can promote you to a colonel, all the way up to colonel, and there's two colonel ranks. You got uh, lieutenant colonel, and then you got what's called full bird. But to go from a colonel to a general, you have to be promoted. Congress has to vote on it. Yeah. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you what. This guy, yeah, war is a racket. And uh, he says, war is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easy, easily the most profitable, and surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope, and the only one which the profits are record in, reckoned in dollars and losses in lives. Boy, I could read this. Um, you know, and he doesn't name names, but you get the idea. Yeah. And... He, um, yeah, he, he was getting into politics, but yeah, but I, I honestly, I wonder if they killed him before, uh, the U S got involved in World War II. So, all right. Um, but enough of that. I'm going to continue reading Judas Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. I think I've got two more chapters left. This is chapter 9 of part 3, and this is going to be, I think, part 27, if memory serves me correctly. Let me check. Yeah, this is going to be part 27. Um, very, very, uh, this is a, I think this is a pretty good book. I really do. Um I'm going to put this in my stash away library. You know, one day the electric's going to shut off. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't claim to be a prophet or anything, but thing is, I, I try to think like the enemy does. I mean, I try to. I was like, well, if I was trying to destroy a world and a nation, how would I do that? You know, Let's see, I would flood the land with uh, invaders. 
and uh, I would take away people's protection. Oh, and by the way, today is August 2nd. Uh, Congress just voted on a bill that basically nullifies um, the Bill of Rights. Uh, take a look at the second, and then you know there's a uh, thing called a, an amendment. Yeah, because you need to get rid of those things if you want to get rid of a people. You know, you want to get rid of their uh, protection. You know, so yeah. Uh, when they get rid of our protection, um, let's just say the, the bad thing is going to happen. There's not many nations that allow their uh, citizens to own protection, if you catch my drift. Um, you know, Australia got rid of theirs, oh, I don't know, 20 some odd years ago. And... Um, yeah, the United States is next. Um, but when the lights go out, all the stuff on the internet, you, you won't be able to access it. So paper books, uh, Bibles, uh, those are the things to have, my opinion. Anyways, and people think that they're just going to lollygag around and living in the cities. Uh, they're wrong. Dead wrong if the uh, medical treatments don't get you the heathen alien hordes will so you know the lord took me on a long long journey it was a hard road too he took me the long way around showed me so many different things and my family were a group of hard heads that have to learn the hard way and that's what he did that's exactly what he did so yeah and i apologize to everybody i've been working full-time job and uh got a restock everything from and pay off some bills after what happened in Arkansas with the liar and the thief and the fake believer so yeah so I'm real behind on my emails and I gotta apologize for that but you know if I answer emails, I don't have much time for Bible studies. And if I do the Bible studies, I don't have time much for emails. But, uh, you know, I will, I've tried to make it a point to always answer people. I've, I've tried to make it a point. I really do, because it's important. And there's going to come a time when um, people are going to have questions and not too many answers out there out so, well there's answers they're found in the bible but uh if you think the antichrists are uh, chosen the chosen for the kingdom well you're all messed up you know so with that in mind let's read chapter nine it's page 333 and the title of the chapter is called the twofold aspect of prophetic prophetic israel the multitude of people which was predicted for the house of joseph never was realized while they dwelt in samaria their palestinian home but the increase of the saxon race is acknowledged to be Phenomenal. National statistics show that the Russian, that uh, that Russia, doubles her population in 140 years. Spain doubled their population in 142. France in 150. Turkey in 555. But that 
England doubles her population every 45 years and that the United States doubles theirs in 25 years. Uh, Bob's note here. You know, when I was a little kid growing up in, um, in Miami in the 60s, uh, the population of the United States was about mm, 130 million. That's 250 now. But a lot of the Saxon children were killed by abortions. And the population growth is the heathen alien invaders. So, which is another... Uh, fulfillment of prophecy revelation chapter 12 i did a bible study on that if you're interested now remember this book was written 100 years ago give or take this is a wonderful vindication of the truth which we're bringing for the word of truth declares thou hast increased the nation o lord thou hast increased the nation thou hast removed it far unto the ends of the earth Isaiah 26, 15. The fulfillment of this prophecy is today called imperialism. Ooh, what a dirty word, huh? Bob, Bob's note here. Yeah, imperialism. You know, everybody wants to come to the West, the white Western Saxon nations. But when we go to their nation and build infrastructure and civilization then we're called imperialists but they all want to come here and live among us where they have they turn on the tap and clean running water comes out of their house and they don't have to go to the local mud hole to get uh, disease ridden filth ridden drinking water you know they flush the toilet and the sewage goes to a plant where it's processed instead of going on the side of the road where flies land on it and then they go over and land on your your food you know you know civilization what can i tell you all right let's keep reading one of the first national characteristics mentioned in prophecy concerning Isaac's seed is that they shall possess of those that hate them. Gates are entrances. National gates are now called ports. Since the acquisition of the Sandwich Isles, Puerto Rico and the Philippines by the United States, the Saxons control nearly all the national gateways of the world. For prior to that time, England and America controlled all the ports of the North American continent and England possessed not only all the ports of the British Isles and those in Australian waters, but also Gibraltar, the Suez Canal, Malta, Alexandria, Egypt, Cyprus Island, uh, gates into China, the German Ocean, the Cape Gate into the Indian Ocean and all the gates of India, gates along the east and west coasts of Africa, and the Cape Horn Gate from the Atlantic into the Pacific Ocean. In the face of such foretold facts as these for the house of Joseph, need we be surprised that God who declared the end from the beginning should include in the blessings of, the, of his birthright man the deep that croucheth beneath his vessels. The Lord also says of Joseph, he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they who together are doing the pushing are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. This seems to imply an alliance, offensive and defensive on the part of these brother nations, the outcome of which will be that they together shall push the rest of the nations to the ends of the earth. Bob's note here. Isn't this what happened in Australia with the Aborigines and New Zealand? Uh, isn't this what happened in America with the, uh, the Indians? Injuns? 
you know? People don't realize it. The Indians used to do human sacrifices and practice cannibalism. But we're the we're imperialists, we're horrible people because we put an end to that. Well, so did the Mex uh, um, the descendants of the modern day Mexicans. They did the same thing. Uh, the Mayans, the Incas, and the Aztecs. You know, Mexico City is built on the ruins of the uh, capital of the Aztec Empire. And they performed human sacrifices. What do you think all those pyramids were for? You know, that's what all those pyramids were. And there's pyramids all over the world. They were, they were uh, places of worship for the, um, the fallen angels. Yeah. You know where the largest pyramid in the world is? It's in China, in the desert in China. And the communists will not let anybody explore it. Yeah. They only discovered it um, during World War II when one of our planes was flying over the pyramid in China when they were helping China fight Japan. And they saw this huge pyramid. I mean, it's a lot larger than the uh, pyramid in um, the Great Pyramid in Egypt. I mean, it's huge. So, you know, people don't, people don't make the connection between uh, demonic worship and these pyramids. I do, you know, but, uh, yeah, but what do I know? All right. Uh, this alliance would be but natural for while it is true that brothers are apt to quarrel and fight among themselves it is also true that one of these brothers is not going to stand by and allow a stranger to jump on his brother and thresh him and while we write that the talk of such an alliance is in the air and we are sure the results will be as god has said god also further says behold the people of israel shall rise up as a great lion and lift himself as a young lion, he shall not lie down until the, until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. A unicorn, a, a, a one-horned Asian rhino, rhinoceros. Not the African type, the Asian type. I did a video on that. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. We have requoted the scripture concerning the eating up of the nations, so that our readers may see that when this time of the destruction of the nations comes, the Lion of Judah, which is with Ephraim, the unicorn of Ephraim and the arrows of Manasseh are together, i.e. England and America. Bob's note here. Um, when I went to college, um, sometimes in the late 80s, the college was giving away uh, old history books. And I grabbed a couple of them. And they were printed around the 19-teens, 1920s. You know, they were 60-year-old books back then. And um, one of the books um, was written just around the time of World War I. And it said that the United States' population was 25% German extraction. And that during World War I, the great majority of Americans wanted to go join uh, World War I, but not to fight against Germany. They wanted to go fight against England. And I wish I still had that book, but a, uh, a Jay bought the, um, 
storage unit place where I had all my books stored when I was looking for a place to, to, to live and um, hit me with a bunch of fees and uh, yeah I lost that book I wish I still had it but whatever I don't remember the name of it but uh, yeah it was interesting so America wanted to go to war against England. After all, Germany didn't burn our capital in the War of 1912, did they? No, it was England. And being England, we're talking about the uh, the real rulers of England. It's not the king or the queen. The real rulers is the Bank of England. And if you know who the banks, yeah, that's the real rulers. So, do you know during the Civil War, the American Civil War, the um, vice president of the Confederacy was a J. Yeah, he was. His name was Benjamin Judah. Yeah. Yep, they always seem to uh, float to the top of the positions of power, don't they? Always behind the scenes. Yeah. All right, so let's keep reading. The Lord also says that this same people, this portion of Jacob is not like them, destroyed, for he, God, is the former of all things. Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. Jeremiah 51, 19 and 20. I did a video on Israel being God's battle axe. What did the Vikings used? Battle axes. Yeah. Yeah, a battle axe is, uh, you know, a sword is faster, but when a sword gets hit by a battle axe, the sword's got a problem. Yeah. Battle axe is uh, more powerful, even though it's slower. All right, so. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurim, a symbol name for Israel, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help and in his excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. That's in Deuteronomy 33, 26 through 27. Bob's note here. God told Israel, get rid of the Canaanites. Get rid of the people of the land. Don't take their daughters for your sons. And don't you take their uh, their their women. And, and don't take, you know... Don't marry their daughters and don't have don't have your daughters marry their sons. Don't do it. Read Ezra chapter 9. Don't argue with me. Argue with God. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel. I'm just the messenger. I don't make the rules. You know, a hundred years ago, interracial marriage was virtually unheard of. They wouldn't have allowed it. All right. This is undoubtedly to be the final outcome of Israel's history, and yet prior to this, and while they are dwelling in the midst of other nations, it is said of them, the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass. And yet it is the very next same verse that the prophet says of the same people that they are the strongest power on the earth who if he go through both treadeth down and teareth in pieces and none can deliver and that's in micah 5 7 and 8. and by the way i am absolutely convinced that germany is judah and it took america and England and half the world 
to defeat Germany in World War II and the same in World War I. You know, the you-know-whos were behind that too. They, they got us to kill our own brethren. How stupid. My father was awarded a Silver Star in World War II. He was a World War II combat veteran. Lied about his age to get into the military when Japan uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. And Silver Star is the third highest decoration you can get. The highest is the Congressional Medal of Honor. But you know, he never, I, we never even knew. The family did not know about the Silver Star until we were cleaning out the closet after his death. He never, he was not proud of it, evidently. Because how do you get medals? By killing people. And I agree with General Patton. In World War II, we fought the wrong enemy. Yeah, we should have been fighting the uh, communists, but hey, what do I know? Uh, in case you don't know it, communism was born on Wall Street. Yeah. Wall Street. Yeah. They don't like to... They don't want you to know about that, but it's true. It's true. But now they don't call it communism. They call it socialism. That's sort of like communism light. You know, you've had light beer, you know. It's, it's still beer watered down, you know. Poison. Watered down poison. Yeah. Here to say the least is a twofold aspect or two characteristics of the same race. That is a people who are as the refreshing and fruitful showers and as due from the Lord to the nations around them. And yet they are a people whom none of those nations who go to war with them can conquer. This double phase of character is due to the fact that they are that portion of the elect race with whom are those who also belong to the election of grace. Bob's note here. Boy, I tell you what. Um, the so-called clergy of this generation, they absolutely detest the word election. Uh, as in the elect, as in a chosen people. They absolutely hate that. Because if, if Christians are the elect, that means we are his chosen people. And they can't have that. They got to have the Antichrist as the chosen people. Yeah, the Antichrist to them, and plural, Christ, plural, Antichrist, you know, with a snake sound at the end, a, a s, yeah, those are their chosen people. And when their Messiah, Yeshua, comes, they will be happy to proclaim that even the Messiah has come. Hey, let's take his mark, his badge of ownership on the right hand or in their forehead. Yeah, you watch. You watch. It's, it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. I'm not going to be so bold as to say, well, God showed me. You know, like I say, I don't claim to be a prophet, but it just fits like a glove. I mean, it just perfectly, like a, a perfectly tailored Hong Kong suit. It just fits like, you know, fits perfectly. Yeah, so that's why um, you always hear these peop uh, these so-called clergy members uh, fighting against election. I mean, they hate that. They, they absolutely detest the idea that Christians could be God's chosen people. I mean, they, they, they hate that. Or rather, should I say, their father, the devil. So, 
I see why God blinds people. I really do. I see why he blinds them spiritually. I mean, here it is. They bless people that curse and hate Jesus, his only begotten son. I mean, really, dude? You're going to bless people that hate the Lord? And then you think God's going to bless you because you asked the Lord to bless those that hate him? Ugh. So, this double phase of character is due to the fact that they are that portion of the elect race with whom are those who also belong to the election of grace. How do you spell grace? It's a G with race. You could take race and put a G in front of it and then you get grace. This is both the national and the spiritual characteristic of the Christianized house of Joseph, for the Lord does say of Ephraim Israel, whom he says is in the isles afar off, whom he also calls the nations, of whom he says, Thou shalt yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria, that they found grace in the wilderness, even Israel. And that's in Jeremiah 31. Uh, in Jeremiah 31, 31, God says he would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Remember, Jeremiah 3, 8, God said he divorced Israel, but not Judah. Big difference, which is lost on most so-called clergy. So... Not a renewed covenant like the uh, Hebrew roots heretics will tell you. Yeah, uh, you know, God gave us the Ten Commandments and 600 and some odd laws. We got to keep them. If we want to be saved, we got to keep the law. They'll tell you. They, they'll have you doing everything except for believing in Jesus. And they don't even call him Jesus. They call him some name that's not even in the Bible because they hate the name of Jesus. And they hate the Son, and they hate the Father that sent the Son. And then they'll tell you, oh, well, there's no J in the Hebrew language, and so his name couldn't be Jesus. So Jerusalem doesn't exist. Uh, Jews don't exist, because there's no J, right? Jerusalem... Jews? Oh, okay. Yeah. So throw that argument in their face. Those deceivers. Liars and deceivers. I know who they work for. Sadly, some people refuse to read their Bible and they listen to these heretics. And their arguments sound somewhat plausible. Until you realize that an angel came down and told Mary and Joseph to call his name Jesus. Oh, but we don't believe that. We believe Hebrew roots people because we, we don't read the Bible. Well, then enjoy your pre-trib rapture prophecy. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You know, I don't have much, I don't have much sympathy for these people. I really don't. Maybe it's because I've spent so much time reading, studying, and believe me, I've, I've read their writings too. I mean, I know what the Messianics so-called believe. I know what the Baptists believe. I know what the Pentecostals believe, and the Methodists, and the, um, the you-know-whos. I know what they believe too, because I've read their writings. You know, if you want to learn what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe, read their materials. Don't read the Baptists writing about the Jehovah's Witnesses. Read the Jehovah's Witnesses' own writings. And that's what I did in Bible college anyway. So you want to know what the Mormons believe? Read their writings. Yeah. You want to know what the uh, you know who's believe? Read their writings.
Yeah, I'm one of those crazy people that uh, wasn't watching television. I was too busy doing studies. And what was it? Festus told Paul, uh, much, much learning to make thee mad. You know, all this learning's making you crazy, Paul. You know what? I kind of get the, the gist of the matter. Yeah. We are told that the law was given by Moses, but that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And since the divine word, which was sent to Jacob, lighted upon Israel, even Ephraim, we know that the grace which they received in their faraway home was the grace of the gospel of the Son of God. The wilderness where these people received the grace of God is that country whither they went when they were cast out of the land of their fathers, which at the time was unknown and uninhabited, hence a wilderness. You know, Bob's note here. Germany was a wilderness. You ever heard of the Black Forest? You know, several hundred years ago, uh, Germany was forest. You ever heard of Sherwood Forest in England? Yeah. Robin Hood, the Sherwood Forest. Yeah. And what about the United States? It was a forest. It was a wilderness. And Israel was to carve out a living among the wilderness. So let's keep reading. The fact that this people received the gospel while cast out lost is also a fulfillment of the prophecy by Jeremiah, in which the Lord says that he will send many fishers, gospel fishers, and they shall fish them. They shall catch them. This is also why we are told that Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? But, questions one, Are there no Gentiles who have become Christians except those nations which are of the birthright kingdom of Israel? Our answer is yes. But each of these also, like Ephraim and Manasseh, needed to be adopted. This is why we are told, as many of you as ha have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And that's in Galatians 3, 28 and 29. Galatia, the Galatians people. Paul went to the so-called Gentiles, but they were Abraham's seed too, some of them anyways. This adoption is necessary in all cases where the persons are of non-Israelite nations, for the covenants, the promises, and the adoptions are Israelite and belong to those and, be, uh, and belong to none who are not of the seed of Abraham. Those who are thus adopted become flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. It is for this reason that Jesus took on himself the seed of Abraham. For it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. This involves many questions which cannot be discussed here, but we take time to say that in order to belong to the election of grace... The adopted son is born of the Spirit, and the homeborn must also be born of the Spirit. It is the conquering, literally fleshly Israel that is the type of the conquering, literal, spiritual Israel. It is the literal, literal fleshly adoption into national Israel, which is the earthly family of God, that is a type of the literal spiritual adoption into the heavenly family of God, of whom Jesus Christ was the firstborn among many brethren. And if memory serves me correctly, this idea comes from the book of Hebrews. 
You notice it's not the book of the Jays. It's the book of the Hebrews. All of Israel were Hebrews, all of them. Uh, Jesus Christ was the firstborn among many brethren, bo both in the flesh and in the spirit, and who is also the firstborn among many brethren in a twofold sense. For he was not only the firstborn among those who are both sons of God and sons of Abraham, but he also was also the first out of the many who shall yet be the children of the resurrection. The fact that Joseph Israel becomes Christianized while cast out of their land is a reason for the following. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, Ye sold yourselves for naught, for nothing, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Isn't that what Christ did? Redeemed us without money? For thus saith the Lord God, My people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. To be redeemed without money is certainly a new covenant truth, and one that is heralded from our prophet, uh, pulpits everywhere. On Mount Zion, inside the walls of Jerusalem, the city of David, where the royal dwelling, hence Zion becomes one of the generic names for the seed of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, or Judah. The captive daughter of Zion, who the Lord declares shall be redeemed without money, went first to Egypt and was also oppressed by the Assyrians. It was the birthright people who were led captive into Assyria. It is the barren woman, the desolate, the woman forsaken, the one who knew the reproach of widowhood, the wife of youth, who had been divorced, of whom the Lord declares that she had more children than when married, and to whom the Lord says, Enlarge the place of thy tent dwelling, and let them stretch forth the curtain of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles. Imperialism, imperialism again. But it is the same woman to whom the Lord says, Thy maker is thine husband. For a small moment have I forsaken thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness. Will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. In righteousness thou shalt be established, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Whosoever shall gather against thee shall fall. For thy sake, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Be this weapon against either the election of grace or against their nation, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage, national and spiritual, of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. And this is in the 54th chapter of the book of Isaiah. For the transgression of my people was he, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, stricken. Jesus said concerning his church, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And concerning this one time cast off and forsaken people, this promise is given. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken. Why? Because the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and the words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of thy mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, not out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Isaiah 59, 20, and 21. The failure hitherto to identify the gospel promises as belonging to that branch of the Abrahamic posterity, which has the accompanying national characters, characteristics, 
characteristics has been the cause of untold confusion, untold harm, untold skepticism, as well as much loudly told infidelity, both within the pale of Christian denominations and out of them. Tom Paine, perhaps you've heard of Thomas Paine, uh, he wrote a booklet called Common Sense. Memory serves me correctly, he was a uh, uh, an atheist, so-called. He was, he, uh, you know, look up Thomas Paine. You know, he, he was around the time of the American Revolution against England, 1776, yeah. Thomas Paine boldly asserted that he was led into infidelity because he saw that the Jewish people never had fulfilled and never could fulfill the prophecies, I mean, the, the prophecies and promises of the Old Testament. In 1898, B. Fay Mills, the one-time spirit-filled evangelist, said, In the fourth place, the prophecies of the Old Testament to Israel have not been realized. Today, he says, the Bible is no more inspired than the Quran. I don't even know who Mills is, but. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, and as I have proposed, so shall it stand. Isaiah 14 and 24. Professor Rawlinson, in his homolect, homo, Homolectics, H O M I L E T I C S, on the above text says, it is weakness on the part of man to need any confirmation of a promise which God makes. When he condescends to swear that his promises shall hold good, it does not really add to the certainty of the thing promised, since the certainty was absolute from the first. But man is so accustomed to mistrust his followers, I'm sorry, to mistrust his fellows, that he will even mistrust God as though with him were variableness or shadow of turning. And yet, this same Professor Rawlinson, when writing of the ten-tribed kingdom of Israel, says, they ceased to exist. Isn't that what you hear today? Oh, you lost Israel. Yeah, they don't exist anymore. Oh, really? So God's promises are a lie, huh, Pastor? No, God's promises aren't a lie. The pastor's a liar, whether intentionally or being deceived. Either way. The ten-tribed kingdom of Israel says they cease to exist. It is painful to find men who will speak so highly of God at one time and so belittle him in regard to his promises to Israel. Well, may the Lord say, Thus have they despised me, my people. Thus have they despised my people, that they should be no more a nation from before them. The Reverend Baring Gould, G-O-U-L-D, tells us that God's first purpose has been partially frustrated. The, churches, the church has taken Israel's place as the body. Hmm. Galatians 3.29, people. Israel's the church, and the church is Israel. Dr. Ladd, L-A-D-D, -D, in Doctrine of Scripture, Volume 1, page 442, says, The Christian church has taken the place of the Jew to receive in different form the substance of the salvation which they expected for themselves. The Christian church is the true Israel, the seed of Abraham, the inheritor and recipient of the messianic prophecies, unquote. Opinions similar to these are held generally throughout the Christian church, while others hold that we are a sort of modern Israel of whom the Bible is silent, and yet both schools appropriate to Christianity all the good things which are promised to the Lord's chosen people and pile all the evil things upon the Jews. As if the Lord were guilty of making promises to one fulfill, uh, people, and fulfilling them to another. As if the Lord were guilty of making promises to one people and fulfilling them 
to another. To be in harmony with these facts, Dr. Ladd should have defined the situation as follows. The Christian church is the true Israel of God, which has received in the same form and substance that salvation which the Jews refused, for it is composed of men who are born of the Spirit and who belong to the material Israel, the seed of Abraham, the inheritors and recipients of the messianic promises and prophecies upon whom lighted the divine word, he whom the Jews rejected. In the chapter on the heraldry of Israel and the Saxons, we explained the lion, the young ox, and the eagle were the camp standards of Israel, but we gave no explanation concerning the man, which was also one of the other, uh, one of which was also one of these four camp standards. The reference to the man in Ezekiel 1 and 10 cites us to Numbers chapter 2 and verse 10, which reads, On the south side shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben. Concerning these symbols, Dr. Seiss, S-E-I-S-S, -S, says, Jewish writers tell us that the standard of each tribe of Israel took the color of the stone which represented it in the high priest's breastplate, and that there was wrought upon each a particular figure, a lion for Judah, a young ox for Ephraim, a man for Reuben, and an eagle for Dan. These were the representative tribes, and all the rest were marshaled under these four standards. And that's covered in Numbers chapter 11. Judah on the east with Issachar and Zebulun. Reuben on the south with Simeon and Gad. Ephraim on the west with Manasseh and Benjamin. And I find that interesting. Ephraim on the west. Where did Ephraim and Manasseh go? The west. Don't they call the white formerly Christian nations, the West. Yeah. And Dan to the North. Uh, the Vikings people, the Danish, the Danish, Dan, Mark, Denmark. Yeah. Uh, but this is just a coincidence, your pastor will tell you. Oh, it's just a coincidence. Yeah, right. And Dan on the north with Asher and Naphtali. In the center of this quadrang uh, quadrangle encampment was the tabernacle of God with four divisions of Levites forming an inner encampment around it. It was thus that Israel was marched through the wilderness under the four banners of the lion, the young ox, the man, and the flying eagle. These were their ensigns, their guards, their coverings, and symbols of power by which they were protected and guided, they were parts of that divine and heavenly administration which led them forth from bondage, preserved them in the wilderness, and finally settled them in the promised land. These facts were undoubtedly known to the compilers of our references, uh, compilers of our reference Bibles. Hence, the references from Ezekiel's vision to the outward, material, and earthly aspect of the people to whom Ezekiel was sent, for he was sent to the ten-tribed kingdom and remained among them seven days. See the former chapter. Bob's note here. Um, you know, the Vikings were called the Norsemen, N-O-R-S-E. Actually, Norse means north, N-O-R-T-H. The Northmen. Look at Sweden, Denmark, Norway, uh, Finland, I, well, I don't know about Finland so much, but uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Seems like I'm missing a country up there, but they're Northern Europe. I mean, they're, some of those countries border the Arctic, Arctic Circle. Yeah, they're cold. I mean, really cold. Blonde hair, blue eyes, red hair. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Swedish women were, uh, you know, <laughs> blonde-haired beauties they were considered. 
probably not anymore because they're all marrying um, Muslims. But uh, yeah. Oh well. But yeah, they were they were the North, the Norsemen, the Vikings. Matter of fact, there's a really good book by uh, called uh, Dan, the Pioneer of Israel by a Fowler, I, I think, Gowler, G-A-W-L-E-R. I think it was Gowler. He was the keeper of the crown jewels. He wrote that book like over 100 years ago. I think it was like the 1890s. Dan, the Pioneer of Israel. You know, you've ever heard of the Dan Yub River? Yeah. You know, it's, there's just too many coincidences for this not to be true. Just way too many. So. All right, let's. Uh, all right, we're reading page 343. We know of no Old Testament scriptures which will show why the ensign of Reuben was a man, except that the name Reuben means behold a son or see a son. Genesis 29, 32 settles that forever. A son presupposes a man. The sons of Benjamin were the men of Benjamin, as we have shown. Also, a son of Israel is a man of Israel. It is certainly fitting that the ensign of Reuben should have been a man, for he was the firstborn of Israel. Bob's note here. Reuben decided he wanted to get some and went into uh, one of his father's uh, females. Um, I don't know. Probably not his mother, but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the Bible tells you he did that, but it doesn't give you a lot of details. I don't know if they were both willing participants or he forced or I don't know. All I know is he went into unto his father's bed. Should have been looking for him a wife when he showed an interest in females, right? You know, so yeah. So he was uh uh Jacob Israel said he was unstable as water and he would not excel because he went up unto his father's bed. Uh let me see if I can find that. Yeah, you want to read some uh end time prophecy stuff? Uh, here's a good chapter. Genesis chapter 49. And Jacob, remember Jacob's name was changed by God to uh, Israel. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather to yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Hey guys, gather around and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the end times. Verse 2, Gather yourselves together, and hear ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Verse 3, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignus, dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. And that's Genesis 49, verse 1 through 4. So, um, do, do, do. Uh, who raised up this righteous man from the... Uh, oh, okay. Okay, uh, let's see. It is certainly fitting that the ensign of Reuben... Should have been a man, for he was the firstborn of Israel. An expression like this. Who raised up this righteous man from the east, as applied to the nation of Israel, may have had some reference to the ensign of the man of Reuben. But if this be so, it would be next to an impossibility to trace it positively 
For the word man is in such general use that should we undertake it, we would soon get lost in the mazes. But we are sure of this one thing, namely that the ensign of the firstborn of Israel was a type of another firstborn of whom the prophet declare, declares, Unto us a child is born. I'm sorry, unto us a son is born. And my people Israel, even Ephraim, shall know. Also, when his son of Abraham was led out to be slain for the sins of that people, Pilate said, Behold the man. You know, Pontius Pilate, when he was getting ready to have Christ crucified, he said, Behold the man. Joseph inherited the firstborn blessing, which Reuben forfeited, and the ensign of the cross in the hands in the hands of the people who are the inheritors of the blessings of the gospel, the grace of the Son of God declared in the arbitrary language of signs, Behold the man. Thus it seems that the double portion of Joseph, which was a type of this double blessing, i.e. the blessing of the Abrahamic birthright and the gospel of grace, for they certainly are the recipients of both. It is for this reason that the Lord says, They, Joseph Israel, shall rejoice in their portion, therefore in their land they shall possess the double, i.e. two portions in the land, Everlasting joy shall be unto them, and their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. Isaiah 61, 7 through 9. Bob's note here. Why does everybody want to come to the West? Why does everybody want to come to the formerly Christian nations? We were the most wealthy and and you know the united states uh, has never really seen we've never seen famine famine is a common thing in africa it's a very common thing in africa and then they have famines and then what do we do we feed them and then what happens they grow in numbers and they kill the farmers and then they complain they don't have any food. Yeah. Yeah, but that that bees ray cyst. Yeah. This word double gives the whole prophecy in the context to Joseph. The next verse is as follows. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my Lord, in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, and as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Among that people who received grace in the wilderness... None may have a clean heart except those who trust the blood of atonement, i.e. the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Prior to the crucifixion of this man, this firstborn son of God, Caiaphas, in the heat of discussion concerning the interests of his nation, said, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And thus spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he unconsciously prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Scattered abroad. The children of God that were scattered abroad at that time were the ten tribes of the birthright kingdom of Israel, and we say without the possibility of being successfully contradicted that the restoration of Israel is in the atonement, and that Jesus not only 
die to fulfill Isaiah 53 and verse 8, but also that he might perform that good thing which he had promised unto the house of Israel. and to the house of Judah, i.e. the gathering, the return, the restoration of his chosen people with all its glorious results. This is why Paul said, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, Bob's note here, yeah, the ten lost northern tribes of Israel are only lost to the modern-day so-called clergy. Paul knew there were, you know, Paul knew about them. So, unto which promise are twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Acts 26 verse 6 and 7. This is why he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together, gathering together unto him. It was because this restoration is all through the words of Moses and the prophets and because Jesus had died to accomplish it that after his resurrection, after his resurrection and just before his ascension, the last question which his apostles, his apostles ask is, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He not, did not tell them that there was to be no restoration. He simply told them that they were not to know the time or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Bob's note here. Um, Jesus didn't even know the day of his return. He said he didn't know, and the angels in heaven don't know, neither any man on earth, but only God the Father knows. And that's the Bob paraphrase. So when you hear people like Harold Camping or whatever say, well, Jesus is coming back on uh, January 32nd in the year 666, uh, yeah, you know they're liars. You know, like the Jehovah's Witnesses have uh, guessed Jesus was going to return like four, five, six times, whatever. I think five times they've said they've set dates. God made liars out of them because that's what they are, liars. So, All right. Later they understood that it was to come with the second coming of Christ, to which time he is to gather Israel and reign over the house of Jacob forever. Thus, on the day of Pentecost, when men out of every nation under heaven were assembled together, Peter said, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath unto him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ. And that's in Acts chapter 2, 29 and through 31. According to this reasoning, David did not expect Christ to sit on his throne until after he shall have been raised from the dead, and we know that he is not on David's throne now. He is sitting at the right hand of God on his throne, for him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince. A prince is a coming king, and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Hacks, Acts 531. Hence Peter, after telling the Jews that this prince whom they had killed was both Lord and Christ, very kindly says, And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it. God help Christians of today to be thus or even more charitable, 
as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Thus we see that the apostles only claimed for others of them were with Peter, that those things which were written concerning the sufferings of Christ were fulfilled. So, Peter continues his discourse saying, And he, God, shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must, re must retain until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath, hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And that's in Acts chapter 3, 17 through 21. Mark that, please. All things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, and nothing else, but surely all that which God hath spoken. Just that, nothing more, nothing less can vindicate. Nothing more is necessary, but it is absolutely essential for the complete vindication of God and his Christ that all which God hath spoken be so fulfilled. All this suffering phases concerning this rejected one, as recorded by all the prophets, have in like manner been fulfilled. The despised and rejected man of sorrows came, the oppressed, afflicted, and grief-stricken man with the marred visage had been smitten. Um, his marred visage had been smitten. He was beaten to a pulp. You know, his face was probably beaten to a pulp too. The stripe beaten back has been bared and has borne its heavy load. The prison, the judgment hall, the trial of mocking, jeering, insulting, spitting, raging mob are come and gone. The dumb lamb whose heart broke and melted like wax within him has been led to the slaughter. In company with criminals, he has poured out his soul unto death, and the mutilated body has been laid away in its foretold rich man's grave. But that grave could not hold its holy treasure for his gospel uh, for his prophet father had said neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption these and many other things which were foretold by the prophets he hath so fulfilled but jesus himself said think not that i am come to destroy the law or the prophets i am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. A jot and a tittle, that's basically a crossing of the T's and the dotting of the I's, basically. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to thy word, it is because there is no light in them till all be fulfilled. The heaven and the earth are still in their places. All that is written in the prophets has not yet been fulfilled, but it shall be. For Gabriel said to Mary, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Not Yeshua. And shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, prophet, high priest, prince, and savior, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. God himself opened heavens and said, This is my beloved Son. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That throne has not yet been given to him, and he shall reign upon the throne of David. And upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice elements which it now lacks from henceforth even forever 
The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Thus we see that these promises concerning David's greater son were fulfilled only in part at his first coming. When Jesus comes a second time, he will come as Shiloh. Bob's note here. Uh, my research points that Shiloh is derived from what they say shalom or peace. Uh, like Jerusalem, Salem, Shiloh, Shalom. Jerusalem, city of peace. Jerusalem, Shalom, Jerusalem, Salem. Yeah, something like that. Unto him shall the people gather, and he shall sit on the throne of his father David, and reign over the house of Jacob forever. For it is written, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. And Bob's note here. And there's a group of people called preterists that'll tell you, oh, all, all prophecy has been fulfilled. It was fulfilled in 70 AD. All the promises God made in the, in the Bible, they're, they're finished. They're done. And they want you to think that ex, uh, judgment and justice are being executed in the world right now. They'll tell you that this wicked world is the kingdom of Christ. Well, it, yeah, I, I believe it is the kingdom of their Christ, not the Christ of the Bible. The Bible says that when Christ returns in the clouds with glory, every eye will see him. I haven't seen that happen yet, so... So they, the preterists must be looking for the Antichrist because that's going to be their, their kingdom. Yeah. I mean... Granted, some of the prophecies were fulfilled in 70 AD. But they basically have to ignore the entire book of Revelation. Did the sea ever give up her dead? Uh, no. Were the graves opened? Resurrection? Did all the people come out? No. No, no, no. People think I'm too harsh on these people. No, I'm not harsh enough. I understand why Jesus grabbed a whip and beat the you-know-who's out of the temple and overthrew their ta tables. Yeah. I like reading that. That gives me, yeah. It is of the, the fact of this coming king for the kingdom of David that when the apostles and elders of the newly formed church were in, were in council, James spoke, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people, the remnant of grace, for his name, i.e. that they might become his bride. And to this agree the words of the prophets, it is written, After this will I, uh, I will return and will build again the tabernacle, the royal dwellings and palaces of David, which are fallen down, those on Mount Zion, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. Acts 15, verses 13 through 16. Jesus died to confirm the promises made to the fathers, not to transfer them. This is an important point. Jesus died to confirm the promises made to the fathers, not to transfer them from one group of people to another. Okay, not from the you know who's to the church. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. That's in Psalms 121, verses 4 and 5. And that, people, is the end of chapter 9, page 349. And I think there's one more chapter left. I'm not sure. I'll have to. The book is getting pretty close to the end. I hope you are 
enjoying this book as much as I am. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.